Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship at First Congregational Church of Benzonia, United Church of Christ. For those of you that are joining us from home, I hope that you have downloaded or uploaded split screen, second device, printed out the order of worship that you may follow along with us and that you have your communion elements ready. For communion this morning, it will be as we have done it um, recently over the past couple of months. If you choose to have a self-serve package, it is out beside the door and you are more than welcome to use that self-serve packaging. If you would like to um, come forward, we will be, I will pass you a slice of a piece of bread. And then uh, depending on what side of the sanctuary you're sitting on, north or south, you will then receive a cup from that side. Step down a little bit, drink it, and the trash cans are off in the corners for you to drop those cups into as you go back to your seats. The table is open for all. Drawing your attention to the announcements that are printed in the back of the bulletin. Um, next weekend, there's lots of stuff going on. On the 11th, we'll meet up at 10 o'clock in the morning if you have the energy to do so for the Marsh Walk out in Arcadia. It's a real easy walk. It's uh, all planked. It's a beautiful walk. Um, do as much of it or as little of it as you would like to do. And then about 11.30 or so, the grill will be going at my house. So everyone is welcome over to my house to have something to snack on, have some lunch together just to be together and outside. Next Sunday is Rally Sunday. Exactly. The kids will all be back in force, hopefully. They'll be back in the classroom. We're actually expecting quite a few kids in the elementary class this year. We're, we're thinking that there's 9 to 10 youth that will be in the elementary class this year. So it's exciting. It's going to be fun. We're going to have some wonderful food after, fellow, after worship for fellowship time next week. So come, we'll pass out some pom-poms and show some rally spirit as we welcome the youth back into class. There's other things that are happening on there um, that you can read for yourself, and I'll answer any questions later if you have them about those activities. Are there any other announcements to be lifted up for the good of the community? Then I move on to joys and concerns. Oh, Chris, I'm sorry. Chris, okay. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, Easton is smaller than Austin. Um, on the baby news, I know some of you know that I have been patiently waiting for my nieces. Um, the one that was actually due late September delivered on Tuesday, a uh, seven pound, 14 ounce little boy, Theodore, Theodore Scott is his name. Theo is there. Um, the sister-in-law, my other niece, is not happy because she should have delivered at the end of August and she is still carrying. I got the news last night that she was headed for the hospital and then in the middle of the night I got false alarm. So we have one, we're waiting on the other. Um, the flower arrangements today are um, provided, left over, enhancing the wonder and the beauty that was Kath Kelder. So these are the flowers from her service yesterday where this room was filled with people celebrating her life. So let us continue to keep Margaret and Carol and Sheila and their families. Yeah, all of the, the pieces of animal life on the windowsills came from, from Cass house. And it was just a way to um, enhance her spirit in the room is to bring the nature that she carried so diligently and heartfelt into the room. So take a, take a stroll around later on and look at all of the really cool critters that she brought in. Other announcements for the good of the community? Chris. Absolutely. 
absolutely for, for Frank's knees. Then I invite you now to center yourselves, to take a deep breath, and to know that the triune God, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, are present with us now as they are present with us always. Let us prepare for worship. Would you join me in the call to worship? Listen, God is welcoming, welcoming us to this time of worship. Young and old, rich and poor, all are welcomed. This is a place where all belong. This is a time when all are accountable to God. The maker of all seeks our common good. The God of mercy calls on us to be merciful. We are not judges over our sisters and brothers. We are not to love our neighbors as ourselves. Come to sing praises and put your trust in God. Come to prepare yourself to serve in Christ's name. Now, if you will join me in able body and spirit, I'd like to have you turn to hymn 478, All Things Bright and Beautiful. If you would join me in a prayer of confession. Rabbi, teacher Jesus, you who taught thousands and yet were willing to learn from the least of these, 
we confess that we pretend to know when in truth we still wonder. Forgive our pretenses that we may open ourselves to unexpected teachers, fresh ideas, one another, to you. Vulnerable Christ, you who lived in generous love, we confess that we have closed ourselves off, that we have seen so much suffering that we stop looking rather than see and respond to those in need. Now, if you join me with the words of the assurance of pardon, disciples, followers, students of the living Christ, know that you are forgiven always and freed to begin anew through God's everlasting mercy and love. I welcome you into communion and as I said earlier this table is open to all. This table actually generally resides out in the fellowship hall with announcements and books and signing cards. It's a work table. It is an old communion table that was given by the Case family. Sometimes the communion table is your living room table or your kitchen nook table. Sometimes communion is a beach blanket down at the lake's edge. This table is open for all. And if you don't believe that you're part of the all, remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his disciples and he ate. And he knew deep within his core and within all of his being that he would be betrayed, that he would be denied, and that he would be deserted. And he sat and he ate with his friends. This table is open. So let us be in prayer. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from the dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel, and we give you thanks for all of our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere, and that you remind, remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and to die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live in glory. We give you thanks, eternal God, for those who have run the race of faith before us and now surround us like a cloud of witnesses. Thank you for those who pass the world word of your love to each new generation. We thank you for martyrs and saints who give themselves in love for you and in the pursuit of peace and justice on earth. We give you thanks, infinite God, 
for the church around the world. We thank you that we count as our brothers and sisters in Christ, people of all races, tongues, and nations. We thank you for those who witness faithfully to you in the midst of political or economic oppression. May all of your people be one. We give you thanks, living God, that here and now you give us the parts to play in the great drama of your love. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered with your sons and daughters of faith in all places and times. We praise you with joy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna be to you, O God. Blessed is the one who comes in, who comes in the name of God. Hosanna's in the highest. On that last night, Jesus took the bread and he lifted it up and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave thanks for all that was and for all that would be. And he broke the bread. And he passed it to his disciples. He passed it to his family and his friends. And he said, take and eat. And every time you do so, do so in the remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the wine and he poured it out. And he poured it out. <laughs> really, he did. I love the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. So he took the cup that was <laughs> full of wine and he blessed it and he gave thanks. And he gave thanks for all that was and for all that would be. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink, figuratively and literally. For every time you do so, it is the cup of blessings poured out for you. Holy One, we unite in this covenant of faith recalling Christ's suffering and death, rejoicing in Christ's resurrection, and awaiting Christ's return in love. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service in behalf of all people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on this bread and grape, on our gifts and on us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be the facilitator of peace and justice in the world. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. Be present with us as we share this meal and throughout all of our lives that we may know you as the Holy One and who with Christ and the Holy Spirit live forever. Amen. It is through the broken bread that we participate in Christ's body. And it is through the cup that we participate in the blessings that Christ brings. Come for all things are ready.
If you would join me, please, in the unison prayer of thanksgiving. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I'd like to read from Proverbs 22. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fail. A, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives out of his bread to the poor. Do not rob the poor, because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted, afflicted at the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of James. We'll be working our way through that for a couple of weeks. So we pick up the story at James, the second chapter, verse 1 through 17. Let us listen anew to the stories that we know. My sisters and brothers, your faith in your glorious Savior Jesus Christ must not allow favoritisms. Suppose there should come to your assembly a person wearing gold rings and fine clothes, and at the same time, a poor person dressed in shabby clothes. Suppose further you were to take notice of the well-dressed one and say, sit right here, in the seat of honor, and say to the poor one, you can stand or sit there over by my footrest. Haven't you in such a case discriminated in your hearts? Haven't you set yourselves up like judges who are down in corrupt decisions? Listen, dear sisters and brothers, didn't God choose those who were poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, the heirs of the kingdom promised to those who love God? Yet you've treated poor people shamefully. Aren't rich people exploiting you? Aren't they the ones who haul you into the courts and who blasphemy the noble name by which you have been called? You're acting rightly, however, if you fulfill the vulnerable law of the scriptures, Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show favoritisms, you commit sin, and the same law convicts you as a transgressor. Those who keep the whole law, except for one small point, are still guilty of breaking all of it. The one who said, no adultery, also said, no killing. So even if you don't commit adultery, if you do commit murder, you still break the law. Talk and behave as people who will be judged by the law of freedom, because judgment without mercy will be the lot of those who are not merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. My sisters and brothers, what good is it to profess faith without practicing? Such faith has no power to save. If, are, if any are in need of clothes and have no food to live on, and you say to one of these, goodbye, good luck, stay warm and well fed, without giving them the bare necessities of life, what good is this? So it is with faith. If good deeds don't go with it, faith is dead. May we be blessed by the reading, hearing, and understanding of God's holy word. Have you ever needed to make a decision and you just couldn't decide? Just didn't know what to do. You looked at all the options and there didn't seem to be one right answer, one perfect solution. You just had to use your best judgment so you could move forward. We see it all the time in sports. And I'm not a big sports fanatic, so all I know is a little bit of football that I used to catch on Sunday afternoons. But that referee always has to make a call. And I was really hoping that Jim would still be sitting there so I could refer to him. But the ref always has to make the call. And the play isn't always really clear from the sidelines, from where we're sitting. 
So it goes under review, whether under the hood or in a huddle. Perhaps you've experienced being in a room full of friends and that great debate happens as the commentators in both the booth discuss the slow motion video of the play. All angles are observed and no matter what we think, we armchair quarterbacks and our decisions, the ref has the final word. We make judgments all the time. We make choices based on the best information that we can gather. From buying a car to where our next vacation will be, sometimes even our medical care is based on a whole lot of research and judgment. We have to make those judgment calls. Sometimes those choices are good ones and sometimes we don't make the best one that we possibly could have. Judgment. But there's a difference between judging and being judgmental. It's amazing how that English language works, right? From judging to being judgmental. From a 2009 Washington Times article, it states, judgment holds our decisions accountable to a standard, often one that we didn't create. The standard is Jesus and his teachings for those of us that are Christian. For us, a majority of our decisions are based on Jesus. The catch is that when we get judgmental, when we compare ourselves to other people, when we do that, we forget about Jesus. We forget God's encompassing love and get self-centered. We rely on our ego. When we get judgmental, it's easy to convince ourselves that we are better than someone else. Of course, we don't always put it like that. Instead, we focus on what's wrong with the other person, with the mistakes that they've made to make us look a little bit better. It's easy to look down on someone who doesn't measure up to our standard, but it might be difficult for us to see that the standard that we're using is our own view of ourselves. Sometimes it's not, and it's not always, that we are better than the other. Our judgmentalism can also tell us that other people are better than we are. We can see people as more successful, more intelligent, more lovable, more talented, more creative. We've all been there. I do it in my own family. I say that I am the only one who is not artistic until I realize that I am artistic with food instead of watercolors and paint and wood. So you add the adjective that someone else is more than you, more than we are. So it works both ways in being judgmental. Whether we think we are superior to someone else or somehow inferior, the problem is that we're being judgmental. That affects the way we treat people, and it can lead us to sin. Remember, I define sin as any way that we are disconnected, that we are separated from God. As we talked last week at the beginning of James, it's more proverb than epistle. It's more wisdom than a call to arms, a rallying cry. This book tells us, it reminds us, it shows us, that faith without deed is nothing. Verses 12 and 13 from that reading, talk and behave as people who will be judged by the law of freedom, because judgment without mercy will be the lot of those who are not merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. When James poses the question, my brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in a glorious Lord Jesus Christ? It sounds as if he's challenging the sincerity of our faith in Jesus. Can you really call yourself Christian if you show favoritism over one person and disdain over another? The whole reading starts right off with, hold the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without acts of favoritism. Hold the faith. That puts a little different slant, right? Instead of asking us if we're really good Christians, James encourages us to show our faith by the way we treat people with fairness 
and objectivity. But whether you think of it as an encouraging statement or a challenging question, one thing is very, very clear. Favoritism within the church is a sin. It separates us from each other, and it separates us from God. The early church had just as much trouble as we do when it comes to ignoring the poor in order to show favor to the rich. I thought I missed a piece. Excuse me. It's like the wine just kind of floats around. Imagine that you are greeting people on a Sunday morning. And this is all hypothetical because we don't do this, right? When a guest comes through the door dressed in expensive clothes, wearing elegant jewelry, and walking with an air of importance. Right behind that guest is a person wearing clothes that are not quite clean and new, carrying a backpack that has most of their possessions in them, and probably hasn't seen a comb or a toothbrush in a couple of days. Of course, we are going to welcome them in the exact same fashion. Good morning. It's so nice to see you. Here's a bulletin. Please stay for coffee time. Right? That's what we do. We are polite. But where will you encourage them to sit? The text speaks that we will direct the guest to sit somewhere. We no longer have that ushering duty that was once very profound and seen in churches. We all have our seat, and whether your name is not on it as it is in a New England church, you know where you sit. Right? Do we direct them to where it will be influential or not? But yet what I find challenging in this question is, where do you sit after you've seated them? It's not where do you seat them, but where do you sit after you have seated them? Do you stay with them or do you go sit somewhere else? Do you sit beside them at coffee time? What assumptions have we already made about these two guests based on our senses, our sight, our hearing, our olfactory senses? What assumptions might we have about the amount of money that they will put into the offering plate as they leave the sanctuary? Or the likelihood that they might want to join the choir, teach a class, serve communion? Goodness gracious, say that they'll actually be on a committee, right? What do we do with all of that? James reminds us that we should not make any distinctions because showing partiality to one person over another divides the community. Playing favorites tears apart the body of Christ and damages our witnesses and our witness into the world. Besides, when we show favor to the rich at the expense of the poor, we go against everything that Jesus taught us. We go against everything. Throughout the scriptures, we find over and over and over again that God honors the oppressed, not the oppressors. God cares about the poor. God has always cared about all. But in the Bible, we've got an awful lot of focus on the oppressed and the poor. And there is something in this passage from James that we might not fully understand, reading from our perspective here in the 21st century versus the first century, year 2021 versus year 62. The people to whom James is writing, they're all most likely poor people. So it's a different perspective. From one of the commentaries that I read in preparing for today, Feasting on the Word, about this passage, um, there's this paragraph, and I quote, in his first year of seminary, Jim Wallace, who went on to found Sojourners, if you read that magazine, he's a great theologian, and his friends did a thorough study of the Bible to find every verse that deals with poor or social injustice. They came up with thousands of references in the first three Gospels. One out of every ten verses deals with oppressed, marginalized, or poor. In Luke, it's one out of seven. 
so it's more frequently. They could not yet recall a single sermon on um, being poor in their home churches. So one of them went out and searched out an old Bible and began to cut out every single biblical text about the poor. I think I want to do this with faith formation class, to find an old Bible and give it to them and have them start cutting out every single passage about the poor. Much of the Psalms are gone. Almost everything that the prophets write is gone. Obviously, the Gospels are one out of ten, one out of seven is gone. The Bible no longer is held together. In the commentary right beside that one, by Aaron uh, Uetti, James reminds them of their own painful experiences at the hands of the wealthy. In their own treatment of the poor, James's readers are endorsing the domination system of the powerful and the rich. Their partiality for wealth sets them at odds with the essence of their faith. James does not want the oppression generated by There we go. We risk the same thing today of being divided, of allowing oppression generated by secular social structures to dictate our moral values. We don't like to think about the ways our treatment of the poor. The week is catching up. And it's all good. So that oppression generated by secular social structures, right? what we think we're supposed to do, and how that affects our moral values. We don't like to think about the ways our treatment of the poor actually keeps them poor. We have social structures set up to keep the poor poor, dependent upon our generosity or the work of the government. We don't like to think about making a deeper commitment to help them to learn new skills and habits that will break that cycle of poverty. And speaking from experience, being in that cycle of poverty is really hard to step out of. It is so hard. My mom was a single mom and we had all the social services that 1973 offered. And when she married dad in 76, the man I call my dad, she lost all of those benefits and we actually took a step deeper into poverty for my mom becoming a married woman. It just, the social structures is there. And we worked out of it, we worked out of it. And it's hard. We would rather give handouts than invest our time and energy in building relationships. James is warning us, as much as he is warning that first century audience, instead of following the world's value systems, a system that often makes the rich richer and the poor poorer, James reminds us of that royal law, that law of freedom, it goes all the way back to Leviticus if you actually want to read all of those laws. But it boils down to this. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. We know this teaching. We know these words. We've taught them in Sunday school class. We use them every day. In the past year and a half, I don't know how many times I've said it when we talk about COVID and how we're supposed to love our neighbor, to take care of our neighbor. The commandment reads, love God first. Right? Love God with all of your heart and mind and soul. And the second is as good as that. To love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two primary rules for life. In order to love your neighbors, we have to spend time with them. To get to know them. To make and keep relationships with them. To live in community with them. 
in this passage though i also offer another place where we are separated from god and that sin that we speak of because loving your neighbor isn't always difficult sometimes it's loving ourselves that catches us up short we don't want to be labeled as proud or self-centered we don't want to be accused of thinking too highly of ourselves but we have to love ourselves we have to stop comparing ourselves to other people so that we can love our neighbor in the very same fashion in this letter to the church to rome paul writes for by the grace given to me i say to everyone among you not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think but think with sober judgment each according to the measures of faith that god has assigned we are careful to practice the kind of humility that actually isn't all that humble at all. From seedbed.com, another place I looked, J.D. Walt writes, according to scripture, the opposite of humility is not pride, but selfishness. And therein lies the problem with our definitions. They are all self-referential. We can't even talk about humility without somehow referencing ourself. Here's what I'm slowly learning. Humility is not about self at all. Humility is all about others. Humility is not putting yourself down. That's false humility. Humility is about lifting others up. So that brings us back to that royal law, that law of freedom, to love others as we love ourselves. It isn't really all about us. It's about loving others, the one in the fine clothes as well as the one in the thrift store remnants. No favorites. Or better yet, we are all favored. I have a friend who is um, mobily challenged, and one day we were trying to move his wheelchair and it got stuck in a door. And it's because he likes to turn too fast in the doorway instead of getting his wheelchair into the door and turning. And I'm like, Jeff, you just gotta. And he goes, Patty, I'm special, not spatial. And I looked at him and I said, we are either all special or we are all nothing. And he just kind of looked at me because I took his special away from him. But it's like, come on, we are all special or we are all nothing. We are all favored. And with that act, mercy triumphs over judgment. Love wins over pride. Caring brings us to mutual freedom. And when we favor each person we meet, and recognize each person as someone God loves so deeply, that God became a human being just to die for that one soul. We become part of something so much more than ourselves. We can become part of the kingdom of God that Jesus came to introduce. Showing God's favor to each person we meet does something else as well. It builds our faith, a faith that really works. As our faith grows stronger and our love for God grows deeper, we will find favoring one person over another makes absolutely, positively no sense at all. God has showered favor on each and every one of us so that we can share it, right? We share it with rich and with poor, with young and with old, because sometimes those are the defining lines instead of monetary resources. It's an age difference that we like to judge on. We like to judge on power issues. We like to judge on ableisms, all of those isms that we place on people. We are each made in the divine image of God. The divine image of God, all as equals. God has no favorites, no favorites. Each and every one of us is a beloved child of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
I invite you as you are able to stand in body or spirit for the inserted song, Open My Eyes That I May See. I invite you now into a spirit of prayer. And as we enter into that spirit of prayer, I lift up one other announcement that I had boldly printed in my bulletin and did not share. And that is starting Tuesday, um, the office is closed tomorrow, so neither Diane nor I will be here. But starting Tuesday, all that enter the building will be required to wear a mask again until such time that numbers are better. We will continue to sing, we will continue to have fellowship, but while in the building and in the worship space, we'll be wearing our masks. So I lift that up in holy prayer for however it may feel and be as we continue to journey through COVID. So into a spirit of prayer, however you speak with your creator the spirit, the God that is bigger than we. Eyes opened or eyes closed, hands folded, stretch for God our neighbor to be in communication with God. Loving and gracious God, we are torn between giggles and tears. In one moment we rejoice and the next we don't. We grieve, we lift all of that up to you today. We lift up COVID and the Delta variants and the other variants and the doctors and the nurses, the vaccinations and the people that do and the people that don't and how we stay in community with each other. Let that not be a place where we judge We lift up the places in the world that are broken, that are hurting, 
from oil leaks in Syria to the people still stuck in Afghanistan to the people who have fled Afghanistan and don't know their next step for the people in Haiti that we no longer speak about in our own country from the Caldor fires to the remains of Hurricane Ida. Your people, our neighbors, we pray for creation. We pray for the governments of the world. May the leaders hear their people's voices. May their ears be open to the words of their people. Globally, nationally, here in this community, May war end, may people be fed, may there be houses, medical care. And Holy God, you know that we have shed enough tears in this community this past week. Much sadness and sorrow in losing Kath and celebrating her life, the giggles that happened in amongst the tears, the stories of love. But let us not forget the others in our community that face the very same grief for their beloveds. And may your grace and mercy tenderly hold all of the people that take care of all of the people. And let us not forget the celebrations of birthdays and new birth and gathered families. One last trip around the lake. One more cookout. One more hike as we gather together. And those celebrations, those fun things that may be just as simple as a cup of coffee and a hello. And God, we pray for ourselves. We pray that we are strong but not so strong, that we are gentle, but not too soft. We pray that we have the strength to walk into your words. And as Kath's button said to be, peace takes courage to be courageous in the peace that you call us to bring. May we be able to proudly proclaim the prayer your son taught us when we walk from this building. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our prayers. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As beloved children of God, we are called to follow Christ, to do the teachings and the work of Christ in one small way to make a difference in the world that Christ calls us to do is to give our offerings 
and whether you do that through the offertory plate, you mail it in, or you do the electronic button on the website, let us stand and dedicate the gifts that we give through our offerings. Please rise. I invite you now to turn to your neighbors, north, south, east, and west, and to share the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. And once again, a reminder that if you need the words for Let There Be Peace, it is in the very back page of the Red Hymnal. So brothers and sisters of Christ, all of us siblings under God, may the God who dwells beyond us and the God who dwells among us and the God who calls us to dwell together bless us today and every day. Amen.